would like to thank you for your appearance here this evening and to welcome you to the series of five lectures and discussions sponsored by the Center for African Studies and Education. We do plan a series, as I said, of lectures and discussions, which would mean then I see myself principally as a stimulus for your thought and a stimulus for our interaction one with the other. And uh, hopefully we will together look, uh, take a very deep look at the phenomenon that we call self-hatred and self-defeat. Not just uh, from an academic point of view, but uh, from a self-confrontational point of view. From the point of view where we gain self-understanding as well as the understanding of our fellow man. The principal thrust of this series is not one where we just sit, we intellectually exercise ourselves, but where we intend to take something from this series and turn it into something practical. Real movement to and turn it into the real empowerment of black people. If we do not convert what we discuss here today and talk about here today into something tangible, into something concrete, something institutional, into an increase into true power, then in a sense the purpose of these series, of this series would have uh, been misguided and uh, misfired. So the intention ultimately, despite the, the intellectual discussions we may get into, is that what we do here turns into something real and expresses itself into uh, into a concrete reality. I want to plug uh, what we're trying to do here, uh, since this may be the first time some of you have managed to uh, visit our establishment here. This, of course, is called the Harlem Graphic Arts Center. And as you can see, we are uh, principally concerned with printing, copying, stationary, uh, typesetting, and uh, typing service, as well as, of course, the the projection of African culture. Our, our position here then is not one merely of a capitalist enterprise. We're here to demonstrate many things. My principal reason for being here as a business person is essentially political. To use this establishment as a political base at the very center of Harlem and in the sense at the very center of black America and of the African world to indicate a number of things. First of all, to, to struggle against the continuing taking over of our community by other ethnic groups. And I want to say that straightforwardly. Each ethnic group, each nation of people has a right to protect its economic interests and has a right to see that its economic resources are used for the advancement of its own people and for the survival of its people. We see today, for instance, the United States is uh, engaging in a major economic, uh, very much engaged with Japan and other nations in trying to protect its economic interests. As a matter of fact, I think in a day or so, perhaps tomorrow or so, President Reagan will impose uh, tariffs on today, is that correct? On uh, Japan. You will see negotiation going on with Japan and other nations in terms of their trade relations ships uh, to this country. If you looked in, I believe it was this week's Business Week magazine, some of you might have had a chance to see it, you would have noticed that there were questions uh, by the editors and writers of that magazine as to whether the United States would be able to compete with Japan and be able to survive economically in the uh, future. Uh, Korea, South Korea is one of the fastest growing nations economically speaking. The, the East Asia region if, uh, poses one of the greatest threats to the economic survival of this country. As I've often said in other contexts, we talk about being equal with the white man, 
when we must recognize that the white man himself is in serious trouble. And being equal with white people is not going to get it. It's not going to cut it for us because these people themselves are trying to maintain their own survival. We have to recognize that we are going to have to be the equals or betters of any people, and that will include whites, uh, Japanese, Asians, or what have you. Our competition in this world is not just against the white man and white people. It is against all people who threaten our survival as a race and as a group. And that threat is increasing. We can no longer hide behind the apron strings of the white man. And, and as he protects his own economic interests, he will by default protect ours. We can no longer rest secure in that kind of thought. In this kind of world with the economic threats the way they are, it's somewhat each man for himself. And we will have to be for ourselves as people. We cannot continue to give our resources up to other people and expect to survive as people. We cannot give our resources up to other people and expect our children to respect us and expect our children to hold us in high esteem. The, a week or so ago I was making somewhat of a differentiation between what I call a pseudo-nationalistic uh, individual or pseudo-nationalistic group and one that is more realistically nationalistic or is more truly nationalistic. And one of the things, one of the criteria I used was the relationship of the group to its children. I think to a degree a pseudo-nationalistic group concerns itself almost exclusively with salvaging the hurt egos of adults. And you find a lot of adults uh, salvaging their egos and, and uh, uh, concerning themselves with history, which is what they should concern themselves with. But we see a lot of adults whose heads are literally on backwards in the sense that they're continually facing the past and not looking to the future. When we, we were talking about Marcus Garvey, and one of the things that I think is, is apparent when you look at Marcus Garvey, not only is there concern with the past and the use of the past and the glorious past of black people, to shore up the pride of black people, to indicate our capacity and genius as a people, but there is an equal concern with the present and with the future. Marcus Garvey was he, uh, greatly concerned with the future of black people. It is not enough for us then to just worship the pyramids of our ancestors. We must leave some pyramids for our children. We must leave them a legacy. And one of the traits, I think, of the true nationalist is that he is concerned with children. They're concerned with children that they're concerned about education of their children. They're concerned about the legacy, economic, social, political, and otherwise, that they will pass on to their children. They are not <coughs> obsessed and compulsively concerned with, uh, with the artifacts of their ancestors. While they respect them, while they study them, while they revere them, while they, they gain from them the psychological, political, and social substance, they also are concerned about creating a world for their children. It is not enough then for them just to criticize Eurocentric education. They build an educational system for their children and see that the educational system works for them and their children. And this has to be done if we are concerned about our survival. How else is our survival assured? other than the security and survival of our children assured. And that means then it has to be assured in terms of economic, social, political, and all of the other powers that are necessary for our survival. So I decided that I would not be one of the ones who just merely talked about what we ought to do and what we should be doing and what they are doing and how they are taking over and not myself become a part of the struggle. This institution that we are establishing here then is in part concrete evidence of mine and others who have joined me efforts to concretely engage <coughs> our enemies and to concretely engage in the construction of a legacy for our future and to concretely build our situation in such a way that we can use the resources of our people for the advancement of our people. We have every right to do so. Do not let some 
person arguing about reverse racism turn you away from the use of your own monies for your own benefit, you have the right to use your own money to your own benefit and to the advancement of black people. Black nationalism as, a, as, a, as an ideology has inbuilt into it the use of one's own resources for, uh, for himself. The assimilationist ideology, however, is now being, in a sense, hoisted on its own petard. It's being caught in the horns of its own dilemma. Thinking that the problem was merely that of racism, thinking that the problem was that of merely being accepted by another group of people, thinking that the problem was that of merely assimilating with other people, it failed then to concern itself with the economic, political uh, development of black people. And it finds itself then, that is the assimilationist establishment, impotent before the takeover of its community by alien forces. Because it finds that if it argues against the takeover by those forces, it will, it will find itself in a contradiction. How can it argue against racism and then argue in terms of race for maintaining its own economic interests? Well, the black nationalists never quite had that, that dilemma to contend with. We have to argue in terms of ourselves and move in terms of ourselves as people. So we need your support here in terms of what we are trying to do. It is very important that we succeed here, not for me, not for any one of the individuals who has joined me in this endeavor, but for us as a people. The greatest political statement, uh, one of the greatest politi political statements we can make here is that of succeeding. You can lecture for two hours on Saturdays and four hours on another day or whenever you want to. And you can do very erudite analyses of Eurocentric psychology and philosophy. And you can dig up the bones of Egyptians and do heavy work on that. But it does very little good when after you leave those lectures, you walk right out and see your major economic establishments controlled by other people. And you have to spend your money with other people. And those people use those monies to manipulate the world and to shape our very lives themselves. Our youth cannot believe in us in a deep sense. When we talk black, and yet when they walk down these streets, they do not see blacks in control of themselves. And they do not see us using the 30 billion or more dollars we have available to us right here in the New York City area when we are not using that money to our own benefit. We come across as hypocritical and insincere and cynical when we, we talk and talk and talk and yet do nothing. And it is the concrete expression of what we are and who we are that is the most influential aspect of our relationship to our children and to other people. Not what we say, but what we do, what we really are, how we really behave. And it is this kind of thing that we are trying to accomplish here, to demonstrate in a concrete sort of way what we say and what we talk about when we are lecturing and we are talking here. So we need then your support here. We, we are here to, to destroy several myths and we, we're working hard, we still face problems and uh, we, we still of course have to deal with the legacy of our existence here in this country, but we're working on them uh, daily. We are trying to, to destroy the myth of the black business person as being inefficient and therefore, we are working on our efficiency. We are not perfect, not at all. And I will not impress you that we are. We are still having organizational problems and development, but we're, we're, we're moving toward it because we know where we want to go. And we want to establish then that the black business person is, is not inefficient. He's not overpriced or she's not overpriced, that uh, they cannot provide the services needed for uh, the people that uh, black people cannot work together and come together as people and accomplish things. I will say in a personal way that when we opened this establishment, personally I was without a job and essentially I still am. No monetary resources whatsoever, personally speaking. And yet even at this point, as you look around you here now, there has been an investment of about $50,000 at this very point.
without there essentially being a penny in my pocket. You see the machines over there. In the back, we, we have a machine that's well uh, approaching uh, some $15,000. We, we are planning another that will approach some $20,000. Uh, believe it or not, these few books that we have up here, even as we grow, this, this amount still represents some five, six, seven, or eight thousand dollars of uh, investment. As a matter of fact, initially it uh, represented uh, ten thousand dollars investment. And you can see to fully stock it and to give it what we want it to be, to make it what we want it to be, would require twenty, thirty thousand uh, dollars or more. And we will stock it and, and we will advance it. How was it done? It was done in terms of people who believed in our dreams and people who believed in me, who believed in themselves and believed in black people as a whole. People who risked their life savings and, and their bits of incomes that they put away on trying to make something be real for us as a people. People who put away the mythology that we can't trust each other, that, that we cannot work together as people and decided that they would take a chance. People who faced their fears and faced the possibility of losing what little money they had saved in an effort to do something for the advancement of our people. And this is it's what it represents. As you look around yourself here, you will see, of course, the African image. We intend, of course, to increase that image even more. We want to destroy the myth that in order for us to create wealth, we must deny our Africanness. That black power and green power are two different things. That is a very vicious sort of lie that gets around in this community. You'll hear some people say, well, I'm not for, for black power, I'm for green power. As if black power and green power are somehow unrelated one to the other. I don't hear uh, Koreans talking about separating uh, um, green power from Korean power or the Japanese separating Japanese power from, from green power. As a matter of fact, it is their very Korean-ness, if you want to say it that way, their very Japanese-ness, their, their very Asian-ness, their very European-ness that is the base and foundation of their economic power. It is the use of their ethnic identity that is the foundation of their economic, political, and social power, not the denial of their ethnicity but the admittance of their ethnicity and the acting upon their ethnicity that is the basis for their economic power. Before one has economic power, one must have an ethnic identity, a national identity. An economic system is just not a system of money. It is a system of social relations between people. And money grows from the relationship that people establish one between the other. Money does not occur first. It is the relationship between people that creates and make money. Money is a social product. It is a creation of man and not a creator of man. And therefore, to establish an economic order, you must first establish a set of appropriate political, social relationships one with the other. So that out of those relationships then can grow wealth and can grow power and, and political strength, and can grow uh, uh, cohesiveness, political and otherwise. Neither of my friends and others who have worked with me in this enterprise was individually wealthy in any sort of way. But it was the combining of our wealth through our relationship as people that had helped to make it possible. But we alone cannot make it succeed. It will take all of us in relationship one to the other, that will make it succeed and that will make this a beachhead for the taking over of this community by black people. And I think this should be a deliberate, conscious goal. We should decide up front that we are going to take this community over. Because this community is a valuable one, not only to the New York City area, but to the whole world of African people. What happens here in Harlem will spread out throughout the world. If we can make this an African city, if it can express our Africanness as a people, it will revolutionize the world of Africans the world over, ladies and gentlemen. If we can make it represent all that is decent and wonderful 
in the African people. If we can bring to it law and order and cleanliness and a beauty and relationship between people, then we would have started a major revolution in this world. Because Harlem still is, to a great extent, the cultural center of the African world. And we should not let this center be what it is today and misrepresent us the way it misrepresents us today. We should, not, we should no longer permit it to be scandalized. I saw today in the New York Post someone referring to, what is it, the Wall Street is just like 125th Street. The idea that people are trading drugs, so 125th Street comes up. I know of some Negroes who are afraid to even come to 125th Street. The image of it is, is, is such. We've known too many writers and too many others who claim to represent us are too willing to degrade it. In their attempts to talk to the guilt mechanism of the whites, they are willing to trade the image of Harlem and black communities the world over and to destroy those communities. So I don't mean to go on about it, but I want you to understand very clearly then what we are trying to accomplish here. We are asking very much your support in accomplishing uh, what we are perfectly capable of accomplishing here. We must recognize as people that the African American is in a very, very important position. Don't deceive yourself, some of you, that you're going back to Africa. Some of you will be going back. But some people use that expression to get, around, get out of their responsibility. Well, you know, I'm not going to give any, I'm not going to do anything here. I, this is not my country. This is, you know, doesn't belong to me. I'm going back to Africa. You know, of course, you, you, you hear those statements for about 15 to 20 years. <laughs> They're still going to Africa 20 years later, having done nothing, having contributed very little. And we have some, of, some people who think that they are less capitalist when they work for white people than when they build their own businesses. So they, they point their ideological fingers at those of us who dare to go into business and think then and accuse us of engaging in capitalist exploitation while they creep down and work for the white man somehow thinking that they are somehow purer than the rest of us who are trying to provide some services for our community and for the rest of us who are trying to channel our money for the use of our community so that we can employ our own and so that we can ultimately make a, a pan-African economic connection between ourselves and our brothers the world over. The economic activities of black people in this country is very, very important to the economic development of black people the world over. You see statuettes over there on that table, you see statuettes, you see masks and other things on this. When I sell those to this population, it is just not a profit for me, but it is a profit for the, cat, for the, for the uh, craftsmen who put those pieces together. It advances the economic development of African people in Africa, in the Caribbean, and in other places. I've also indicated that we must look at problems not only in terms of how me, we may escape from them. It's not only a matter of how we may escape from America, but how may we subject America to our influence as a people? How may we stay in it and see that it works for us? How do we escape the thought that we could perhaps even take over the country? Sounds drastic. <laughs> it's a thought that we, we, ever, we rarely hear discussed. Other ethnic groups can have secret meetings. They can form all kinds of organizations and secretly manipulate the nation with less than 3% of the population. And yet we, with over 12 or more percent, feel as if the only way we can deal with America is to escape it and run away from it. The Jewish population with less than 3% literally dictates the foreign policy of this country. And if you've seen the debacle that the Reagan administration has gotten in in the last few months, you will recognize that it, to a good extent, is the result of this small group of people who've used their economic, political, and organizational power to see that this large nation, even at the point of bringing us into a third world war, even to the point of the total destruction of mankind, has seen to it that this country operates in the interest of that nation. That country, Israel, is a welfare case. It lives off the welfare of the United States. It cannot survive on its own. It eats up our tax money. It eats up our labors. And we support it, not only through taxes, 
We support it through paying heat bills and light bills and all of the other kind of bills. We support it through taking lower wages. We support it through losing jobs and everything else. And we give our very guts and blood and sweat to the support of that nation. Then there is no reason why we cannot use our own selves and our own monies and our own political savvy and our own organizational savvy to see that this nation relates to African nations in a way that benefits African countries and not run away from the issue by hollering we are African and we are going back to Africa, therefore we will have nothing to do with it, or it's a, so, it's a, a capitalist country, therefore we will refuse to engage in business or in commerce at all in it. That is not the way it happens, ladies and gentlemen. It is not realistic. The survival of Africa is our only assurance of our survival here in this nation. All right. And to a great extent, these two things are connected. Our activity here is very directly connected to the activities in Africa. Why does the white man rule in South Africa? Because he is a majority in South Africa? Not at all. Because of his connection with other white nations. And what are we saying here? Why then cannot we be influential in this country because we are a minority, ladies and gentlemen? No. We can be influential because of our connection to other African nations. And through Pan-Africanism, even as a so-called minority in this country, there is no reason why we cannot manipulate its policies and its economic system to our own advantage. And we have to then begin to look at those relationships and to create those kind of relationships and those kind of organizations and the kind of political economic structure, being a minority that we are, such that even as a minority, we can influence the direction of this nation and not hide behind some wishful thinking about the return to Africa. When we return to Africa, we should then be able to bring to that continent something other than our hurt egos, something other than our running away from racism, we do not want to load it down with our pains and problems. We want to bring some real positive contributions to it. We are at the belly of the beast. We are at the center of the, tech, the most technologically advanced country in this world at this point. It is important that we get everything out of it that we can and transfer that information. Look at Pollard. Some of you are familiar with that case? Yes, exporting the secrets of this country right out to the Israelis. What are the Jews concerned with now? The so-called double loyalty? They're afraid that Americans, particularly white Americans, will be conscious of the fact that they have double loyalties such that they will utilize the resources and wealth and knowledge and information of this country to advance the interests of Israel which, ladies and gentlemen, often are not compatible with the, the interests of this country. And we then have to realize that we too can use the resources of this nation for our own, to our own advantage. So I will now go into the subject matter at hand, and we will allow time for, um, for discussion uh, a bit later, because I do uh, want us to discuss a good deal. I just don't want to engage in a lecture situation where, in a way, despite my good intentions, I have to maintain something we have to get out of, and that, of course, is passivity. And that, of course, is the bending to, quote unquote, so called authority. You see, we must be, uh, be actively engaged in our, our liberation as a people. So I see myself here today essentially as a facilitator and a stimulator, but I see the essential success of this series resting upon all of us here in this room and upon our willingness to be honest with each other and to be forthright. As you've noted, uh, we, we will do a series of five lecture discussions. The uh, first uh, aspects of the discussion will center around the production of self-hatred our self negation in the African American personality and in the African in general the world over because this system that has been established by the Europeans is a world system and so let us not mistake uh, that what I'm talking about here tonight refers only to Africans in America I'm speaking of Africans wherever we find them 
because the European system is a global system. The economic system is a global system, and the effects of that system then uh, is felt by black people the world over. We'll look then at uh, how this attitude of self-hatred is introduced into the African personality. And it's very, very important that we look at that uh, closely, even though we will be covering some ground that many of you are already familiar with. I'll just ask your indulgence and patience because I think it's ground we need to look at again for a moment. Then, of course, we are going to look at the, the what I might call the compensatory uh, reactions we have had as people to the European attempts to interject into us uh, attitudes of self-hatred. We are going to look at the behaviors that demonstrate self-hatred. And here again, we'll look at economic behavior, we'll look at uh, uh, love relationship behavior, family behavior, and other kinds of behaviors that are indicative of implanted Eurocentric uh, attitudes, Eurocentrically based attitudes of self-hatred. And then we will look at the various methods and techniques by which we can counteract and get over these uh, deeply implanted attitudes. We will try at the, at, in those discussions to come up with very concrete ways of dealing with the attitudes of self-hatred that have been implanted. As a working definition of self-hatred, we will, of course, define it more uh, succinctly as we pursue this lecture series. I will look at self-hatred <laughs> and self-defense as being, uh, uh, self-defeat as being manifested or expressed as a contempt or a dislike, indifference, hostility towards one's ethnic, familial, cultural, personal background and or characteristics, such that one is moved to deny, to destroy, radically restructure those characteristics or purported characteristics or erroneously or deceptively perceive oneself so as to be deemed acceptable to, to others or not be rejected by others. Essentially then we, we see self-hatred as an attitude often of, of, of contempt or dislike for one's realistic and objective characteristics, for one's cultural characteristics of familial background it is not only an attitude that we're concerned with when we talk about self-hatred. We're also talking about a behavioral tendency, the tendency then to, to restructure those characteristics without regard to their positive nature, to even destroy them or to deny their existence so that we may be accepted by some other group or some other person outside of ourselves who we, whose acceptance we deem as more important than our own self-acceptance. It is an attempt often uh, by the individual then to almost deliberately misperceive himself in such a way to, as to find himself accepted by others or to relate to others in such a way that one's objective characteristics and self-devalued characteristics are kept outside of his consciousness or his field of consciousness. So we are talking about people whose contempt and, and whose attitude of this life toward their ethnic familial uh, characteristics and cultural characteristics as such that they often seek to push those characteristics out of their consciousness, to place them in their minds in such a way that they are not reminded of their existence particularly in order to gain the acceptance of another people. When we talk about self-defeat, we're talking about a defeat that occurs despite the individual's resources, the individual's capacities and abilities, when due to his erroneous self-perception, his attitude with regard to himself, his self-maintained emotional, cognitive, and behavioral state and orientations, prevent him from attempting or achieving consciously desired goals. That is, we, 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 uh, we refer to self-defeat as a situation when an individual has the capacity to accomplish what he, what he desires, 
He has the ability. He has the resources. But he has attitudes and, and perceptions of himself, attitudes toward himself and perceptions of himself that prevent him from achieving those desired goals. He behaves in such a way, despite his capabilities and abilities, that those abilities are not used in advancing his own interests and in accomplishing his own goals. The major issue then when we talk about self-defeat in terms of African people is not a, an emphasis on an absence of resources, but an attitude such that the resources are not used for our own advancement. And we started this lecture out here tonight in a sense talking about that. When you pass this corner here, you'll see a favor shoe store there that pays $10,000 a month for rent. And when you look in it, you will see black people spending money there. Their money will pay that rent and will turn a profit for the owners of that business. So there is not an absence of monetary resources here, ladies and gentlemen. You will look across the street and you will see a Lane Bryant store just opened last week. And I will estimate he's probably paying anywhere from five to $10,000 a month rent and you will see its customers essentially being black. Within this block, from what 7th Avenue here up to, to 8th Avenue and a little beyond, you are not gonna hardly get a place of any size under three to four to $5,000 a month. And yet we see people building and moving in and running viable businesses in this area. What does this mean? It, does, it means then, ladies and gentlemen, that black people in the Harlem community are not poor. When you stack up on top of that the millions of dollars that are taken out of here for the payment of drug and crack, when you stack up on top of that the millions of dollars that are paid in the form of rent, the millions of dollars of governmental so-called money being put in in form of welfare, supplemental income and so forth that are also flying out of this community, you will see that this is not a poor community even though it is projected as one. Other people can come to it and support their families. And yet somehow we find it impossible for us to support our families. It is our money. What is then the problem here, ladies and gentlemen? The problem then is not an absence of money in Harlem. It's not an absence of money in black America. It is not an absence of gold in Africa. It is not an absence of oil in Africa. It is not an absence of minerals in Africa. The southern tip of Africa supplies this country with, in many instances, 100% of the minerals it needs to run its technological society. The minerals that make the space age possible in this country come from the African continent itself. The only other European country that has those minerals to any significant degree is Russia. And it is out of that southern tip of Africa that this country uh, maintains its technological system, and yet Africans starve over, the, over those minerals. So what we are talking about here, ladies and gentlemen, is not an absence of resources, but somehow an absence of the ability or an unexplored use of the ability to turn those resources to our own advantage. And we talk about self-defeat when this re refusal or this inability to turn our resources to our own advantage is the result of our own misperception and our own behavior, not the deliberate behavior where others come in and block it, but the behavior where we ourselves, the kind of behavior we, we emit ourselves is chiefly responsible for our own uh, lack of achieving the goals. And like it or not, the thing we have to keep in mind is despite how much we cry about our victimization, we must face the reality that we too are part of the problem. That we too participate to a degree in our own victimization as people. And we have to face that. Does it mean that we're totally responsible for our situation? I'm not saying that at all. But I'm also not saying that we do not have some of the responsibility for the position that we're in. 
and therefore we must recognize that responsibility and assume that responsibility for the situation we're in. And when we then negate the assumption of that responsibility through our own misbehavior, then we must talk about self-defeat. So we, so the self I'm referring to refers to the way we think, we feel about ourselves, the way we evaluate ourselves, what we believe about ourselves, the way we imagine ourselves to look to ourselves, and the way we believe others see us. So essentially then we, we are looking, we've looked at the three concepts of self-hatred, self-defeat, and the concept of the self. The thing though that we have to recognize though, the self is not uh, merely an individual achievement. The human self is really a social construction. Try to imagine what kind of self you would be if you existed totally alone in the universe. You'd never seen anyone else in your life. You'd never interacted with any other person in your life. What kind of person would you be? Would you be who you are today? Would you speak the language you speak today? Would you dress the way you dress today? Would you walk the way you walk? Would you behave? The, in a sense, the question almost becomes irrelevant, doesn't it? If there's no one else around, why should we, why do we even need to talk about what? Self and personality. Self and personality then is essentially a social construction and takes place within a social context. It takes place within a network and a web of human relationships. So even what we call ourselves is not in a total sense ourselves. To a good extent, it is other people as well. To what we call ourselves, to a great extent, is the contribution that our interaction with other people have made to this image that we call self. To a good extent, what we call ourselves is this whole complex of experiences we have had and interactions we have had with others as they speak through our mouths and, in a sense, use our body to express themselves. unique way of representing our social experience as an individual. And this becomes very uh, apparent when you see people uh, suffering from what we call multiple personalities. And you can see the personality splitting up. And you recognize then that uh, some of you are familiar with uh, Sybil, who had something like 17. And I think Billy Mulligan had about 24. <laughs> and. Uh, the three faces of Eve indicated that she had three personalities. But these, all of these things indicate then that what we call the individual or the self is essentially a patchwork or a melding of many selves into a unique expression that we call the individual. And with a strong ego a center, these, these contributions by others can be represented as a unity. However, under stress, and under mental disorganization, they can split into almost independent parts so that you can see sometimes the body being taken over by one personality or the other, and sometimes two personalities coexisting at one and the same time. So it indicates then that to a good extent what we call the self is, as I have said uh, before, a social construction. It is the result of the kind of social re uh, interaction we have with other people, which is one of the reasons why, ladies and gentlemen, then, that if we're concerned with the kind of self that we as individuals uh, shall have, that our children shall have, then we must be concerned with the kind of social interaction they will have, the kind of social relationships that they will encounter, the kind of world they will live in. In a sense, then, ourselves uh, are a product not only of the people we interact with, but of all of the other objects we interact with in the world. Our technology here, in a sense, contributes to the way we think of ourselves. Trees and flowers, rocks and lakes and ponds and rivers also are part of our self-construction. And therefore, what we are saying here then is the social environment as well as the physical environment 
psychological environment contribute to what we call the self. How we will think of ourselves. And therefore, in the shaping of ourselves, we should be very conscious of what kind of influence we would allow these other objects to have. I'm going to look for a moment at a standard text of some of my students I see here are very familiar with this textbook, one of the standard texts that's used in, uh, in, in the college. And I wish I had time to talk about these books. We, we don't have time and how they are constructed and designed. But they are of great use to us. You see, too often many of us reject these books simply because they're written by white folk and we let them go at that. And that written, then you will be educated into ignorance. As so many of you have heard me say often, the black man in the college and in the university and in the school is educated into ignorance. He's made stupid by education. But you must recognize, ladies and gentlemen, to a good extent, the European domination of black people depends upon the continuing ignorance of black people. And you must recognize then that no institution that is designed by these people is designed to get us out of that ignorance. Therefore, even the institutions of learning will help us learn to be dumb. We are taught to be dumb. See, learning is not something that just happens to you. Learning often is something that you, and learning to be dumb is something that we can often actively engage in. You see? The essence of education is to not learn just what those white children learn, <laughs> as we often hear people say. Because, ladies and gentlemen, this is not going to get us where we want to go. I look at this section here, it's called the social learning approach. And I try to get my students to understand that if you look at this correctly, written into this particular section is a very method and technique by which the black man is created and manipulated. What arrogance this white man has for us. He does not hide his knowledge. He puts it right in our hands. He does not forbid that we buy the books. He puts, them he puts libraries in our neighborhoods and dares us to read them <laughs> and understand them. <laughs> he even lets us into the college and into the university and yet dares us to look closely enough at them to what arrogance, what contempt for our capacity as people though, isn't it? To say I'm going to place right before you the keys to how I manipulate you and create you and I dare you to understand it and I dare you to use it. <laughs> Because you see, what you're going to do is say, I made an A on the test the same way the white boy did. And because I made the A and he made the A, we are equally educated. Not by a long shot. Not by a long shot. Because you're learning directly what's in this book is going to have a different effect. You shall know a tree by what? The fruit it bears. And you have to look at it in terms of what has this psychology born for black people. Not, is this the psychology that they learned at Harvard? Then if I learn it, then that makes me equally educated. Stupidness, pure stupidness. I told some of my white colleagues at the other college from which I was unceremoniously <laughs> thrown out. <laughs> you teach this stuff here every day. Show me where this stuff that you taught has advanced the interest of the black and Hispanic community. Show me where it has improved the education of black children. Show me where it has increased their reading capacity. Show me where it has actually worked mentally, physically, economically, and socially, and politically for the advancement of black people. He could not do it, ladies and gentlemen. But yet he insisted that everyone who teaches this course has the appropriate credentials. What do we mean, credentials? What are you talking about? Are we merely to look at the credentials of the individual that teaches it? Are we merely to look at the so-called content of the course and say from that then that the individual is getting the kind of education they should have? Not at all, ladies and gentlemen. We must recognize as black people we have to have a different criterion for what is a good education and for what is not. And credentials is not necessarily one of them. 
particularly so-called degrees. We have a school system filled with white educated people, with white people, with degree people, and yet we talk every day about the educational problem that our children face. We've increased money since the 60s, we've increased resources so-called since the 60s, and we've seen what? The educational quality go down. It's almost as if the more money you give and the more you demand degrees and special ed and degrees and reading and degrees and this, the worse the educational system gets. The more degrees you get in social work and psychology, the crazier people get. <laughs> Look at it. It, 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 it almost goes the other way around. You know, the more experts you produce, the worse the, the situation becomes. I think one of the worst things to happen to the educational system was the appearance of educational experts, I believe. Uh -huh. yeah. People who what? Supposed to know. No. And a system that's full of them, and yet black children are not being educated at all. It means that there's something else missing we have to look at. But let's look at this social learning theory. Social, the social learning approach. Social, of course, implies a relationship between people. A systematic relationship between people. Learning implies then a relatively permanent change in behavior, which occurs as a result of practice or experience. And when we talk about then a social learning approach, we talk about the how the individual uh, achieves a relatively permanent change in behavior as a result of his relationship with other people. And, then, and, and it indicates then the power of social relationships. Let's look then at this uh, social learning theory and what it says here. This is from uh, the book Introduction to Psychology by Rita Atkinson, Richard Atkinson, and Ernest Hilgard. And it reads, social learning theory in contrast to other theories, and we won't talk about the other theories, emphasizes the importance of environmental or situational determinants of behavior. Note the emphasis, and the word environmental and situational is put in italics. It's very interesting, you know, and one of the things I have to spend some weeks often getting my students to understand is to pay attention to the italicized words for a lot of reasons. But in the sense, this is the author's way of projecting what he or she considers the most important part of uh, the text. In a sense, the author is underlining the text for you. And I often say, if you do not understand the italicized words, you really don't understand the passage. Use the italicized words as a review. If you want to do a quick review, look up the italicized words to see if you understand what they mean. Because pretty much if you understand those words, you have a pretty good sense of what the whole thing is about. And you can self-test by seeing the degree to which you understand the italicized concepts. And you, and you, you, look, you, you, you look at the concept, you look away from it, repeat what it is, look back and see if there is some correspondence between the way you stated it and the way it is presented there in the text. A quick way there, so there's a great deal of advantage to these italicized words. But in another way, you can see the author projecting what he or she sees as important. And so the word, the italicized words are environmental and situational determinants of behavior. As we noted in chapter 11, the social learning approach to motivation focuses on the patterns of behavior the individual learns in coping with the environment. A very interesting statement there, isn't it? Let's read it again. The social learning approach to motivation focuses on the patterns of behavior the individual learns in coping with the environment. This implies then that the habits, the behavioral tendencies we exhibit as personalities and as persons to a good degree are the result of the kinds of social interactions we've had with our environment, including other people. That we learn to be who we are to a good extent as a result of learning to cope with our environment. A very important statement. In that statement is a whole concept of social engineering in it. Built right into it. You see, but if you're taking this course just for credit, if you're taking this course just to qualify for a job, just to work for somebody else, you miss the whole thing. Oh, you see, 
And this is the motivation that many, many of our people come into class with, you see. But if you're looking to control people, right? If you're looking to make them buy no good articles, if you're looking to rape and rob them of their resources, you read between the lines, you look at the implications. You see, there's no way you can assure equality of education by having two or three people sit in front of the same teacher. You're not going to get equality of education in black children by having them sit in the front of the same teacher, ladies and gentlemen. That idea is ludicrous. Because a person gets out of a classroom what they bring into it. A person gets out of a classroom what their motivational characteristics bring to the class. If you come in there just to qualify for a degree, you'll come out of that class with something different from a student who comes in there to gain power. If you come in there just to be a servant of another people, you're going to come out of there with something different from the one who intends to be the master of another people. Even though you've read the same words and you've taken the same exam, you're not getting the same education. And I'm saying this because I want to attack this myth of equal education that has been the foundation of so much black agitation here. And, and to get you to recognize that that concept of equal education is empty and it does not have much meaning. It sounds good, it sounds appropriate, but think about it a bit. Look at it a bit. When your destiny is to overthrow a person that's riding your back, when you are going to deal with the issues that your resources are being taken from you, that millions of our people are near the point of starvation, then you will recognize that the destiny of black people and the destiny of black children is revolutionary. That the destiny of the white child is conservative to maintain what they already have and to increase the advantages they already have. That's a fundamental difference, ladies and gentlemen. And consequently, an education has to be fundamentally different. One has to be educated for revolution for overthrow, for change. And the other one has to be educated for conservatism, ladies and gentlemen. Consequently, the idea of giving them the same education, equal education, is ludicrous. The idea of rearing them in the same way is ludicrous. The idea of organizing the community in the same way is ludicrous because they have two separate set of goals. And you must take those goals into mind when you start talking about how you can educate your children. You must keep those goals in mind when you talk about how you're going to raise your children. You raise your children for a world, for a future, for an idea, for a concept of what a world is going to be like in the future, and you raise them for the idea of creating the kind of world you want. They're not just reared to be good little children. They're not reared to be obedient. They're not just reared to learn their ABCs. They must be educated to bring about some change in the world. And, it's, it's, you, it, and therefore, the black education has to be defined within that context, not within the context of what do white children learn when they're in grade one? What do white children learn in the fifth grade? What do they learn over at this school? What do they learn at Hunter College? What, and therefore, we should learn it over here. No way. Mm -mm. Your school has to be organized curriculum has to be developed within the context of where you want to go as African people. And whether it resembles another group of people's institution or not should be purely coincidental. Nothing else. You should not run over and look at the other people and assume, well, they're successful, therefore we're going to do what they do. It doesn't work that way. And so what we're saying here then, what is being, the power statement here is this, that if you can control an individual's environment right and this is what's in this sentence if you if we say that the patterns of behavior that the individual learns in coping with the environment then we can infer from that then that the kind of environment the individual inhabits will influence the kind and patterns of behavior he will uh, evidence as a person an individual then who is seeking for power who then wants to create people so that they would have a definite relationship to him will say then that the first thing I must control is what? The environment. I must create an environment because the individual, if he's to survive in that environment, must learn to cope with it. 
And if it's a tough environment, he must learn to be tough if he's going to make it. If it's an environment that requires him to hustle, then he's got to learn how to hustle. And he's got to learn how to... And yet, as he learns all of these things, they're going to become a part of his personality. And in ways they're going to help him, and in ways they're going to stand against him. And therefore, if I create the environment, I can, to a good extent, create the individual. And therefore, the people in power will read the statement, and they will go back to their planning boards and say, how can I create the environment such that black people will be dumb? They will be ignorant. They will hate themselves. They will lack disunity in their relationships one with the other. They will see me as the final validator of truth. They will see my acceptance as the ultimate acceptance. How can I create in them that mentality? And you will see them then creating the appropriate environment. The invasion of this community by Asians and other ethnic groups is a part of the creation of the mentality and personality of black people. It's going to create your children out here. As they walk down these blocks, their personality is being formed as they learn to so-called cope and deal with this situation out here. And to, to the extent that we sit back and let it happen, to that extent, we're participating also in their creation. It goes on to say, for social learning theories, behavior is the result of a continuous interaction between personal and environmental variables. Environmental conditions shape behavior through learning. A person's behavior, in turn, shapes the environment. There's a reciprocal relationship. We create the environment, and we create a behavior orientation. And then the, the person with the behavioral orientation, what? Recreates his environment. You put him in a slum and then he develops slummy behavior. And then once he develops slummy behavior, he will make slums wherever he goes. And then we will say that he's a slummy person by nature. You know, that's the game. Create create that environment so it's a creative personality and you see it's a slick game and often you see as people we are not aware of the first creation how was the first creation brought about the only thing we often see as a result of the creation and we see ourselves behaving in a certain sort of way and the other group then says you behave that way because you're black you behave that way because you're African you see and when you fail then to see how the situation was created then one begins to condemn himself in terms just of himself. And this is why knowledge of how the, how the situation was created is very, very important. This is why ultimately when one gets to know himself, he gets to know other people. You cannot know yourself well and not know other people and ultimately know the universe. The route to getting to know the universe and to getting to know what is going on in the world is through the self, ladies and gentlemen. Because, as I stated before, the self is the result of the universe we live in. And therefore, self-knowledge means getting to know self-creation. And when other people have created the self that one is, then it means getting to know those other people and getting to know how they went about their creation. And that's very important to the recreation of oneself in terms of one's own uh, criteria and one's own values. But unless you get there, and this, you see, is an essential part of African education. The white people don't have to learn this. They don't need to learn this. So therefore, they do not include this knowledge into their curriculum. They do not see it as an important part of education. And a black person then who does not include this as an important part of their education is going to be educated into ignorance and stupidity. And a black person who sees this kind of education as a SOP course as a, uh, what do you call them, elective. Of course, you pick up on the side is one that's going to be miseducated. This is the very foundation and basis of any sound education and should occur first, not second, not in the third year of college, not in the last year of college, but should occur in the very first semester. Should occur really in the very first years of elementary school and work themselves right on up. And so we have it here. The environmental conditions shape behavior through learning. A person's behavior in turn shapes the environment. Persons and situations influence each other reciprocally. To predict behavior, we need to know how the characteristics of the individual interact with the characteristics of the situation. Now, I've often told people the point of psychology, European psychology, is control. 
you know, a lot of people talk about psychology not being so-called science and not being able to predict behavior the way chemistry and mathematics. That's, that's off the point. That's really not the point of it at all. Because the point of psychology in a Eurocentric sense is not really to describe man as he is, but to learn the ways and means of controlling man to the benefit of the European. That's the, the basic point. And when you can con create people, when you can control people, then your problem of prediction is what? It's solved, ladies and gentlemen. It's solved. You see? So when you, re when you remove people's, you remove certain thinking skills from people, when you induce into them certain emotional uh, orientations, when you keep away from them certain intelligence in terms of knowledge, you're creating a personality and you can begin to predict how those people are most likely to behave under certain circumstances. You know what they are, what capable of doing, you see. And therefore, as a Eurocentric psychologist, what you're mainly concerned with is not so much predicting the behavior, but creating the possibilities of some behaviors and the impossibilities of others. And so the main thing you're concerned with is the technique by which this is accomplished, because the prediction part will pretty much take care of itself. And so we have it right here. To predict, we need to know how the characteristics of an individual interact with the characteristics of the situation. You have to interpret this Afrocentrically, you see. Now, many courses will read it and run it through just like that and leave it at that. But see, the white boy, that's all he needs. He doesn't need the other part, the part that I've just talked to you about right now. Because you see, while he's in the college, his dad is another that already manipulated the world. You see, and when he gets out, he will enter into that system and learn the real information. But the black one who will learn it as well or better will still be in a position of powerlessness. You see, because often he, he has not read between the lines, and often because he's discriminated against, he will not get into the very center of power where he can see the real deal. And so he'll be left with his theoretical propositions, and he'll be proud of his unrealistic learning. <laughs> and he will talk about it and, and, and think that his degree, because it is equal to some white man's degree, that it has equal potency, and it does not. It has very little meaning. In fact, that is a part of the deception as well. It goes on to say, reinforcement and social learning. The effect of other people, the rewards and punishments they provide, is an important influence on an individual's behavior. Very potent statement there, isn't it? In fact, that is a power statement, isn't it? Yeah, it's a power statement. Infused throughout this whole thing is, how do you gain power? and influence over other people. How do you manipulate other people? This is a manual about power. Of course, it's not written that way, is it? It's pure, bland, objective, non-racial psychology. Nonsense. There is no course that's non-political. That is the greatest deception run upon black people, that courses are non-political. That is the most political statement of all. Oh, this is an objective course. It has nothing to do with race, then. I'm in the wrong course. <laughs> According to social learning theory, individual differences in behavior result in large part from differences in the kinds of experiences encountered, listen, in the course of growing up. Did we hear that? Very powerful statement here. What does it say? Individual differences... And when I use the word individual, think of group. This is another deception that is run on black people, particularly in psychology. Because often the, the psychology is projected as being about individuals. You see? And often the, the black student then thinks in terms of individuals. And consequently is restricted in what he learns. When you're in these courses and they talk about individual, elevate them up to the group level. You see, because it's to the advantage of the white man, in, in, a, in a sense, while he's educating you at the same time to lower your consciousness to talk about individuals, see, so that you can think that we're just concerned with single entities and not with what?
peoples and the relationships of people one to the other. And if you don't deliberately and consciously say, wait a minute, let me think about this in terms of groups, then you're caught and miseducated right at that point, even though you know the principle well. It says individual differences, but let's, let's, let's substitute the word group. Group differences in behavior result in large part from differences in the kinds of learning experiences encountered in the course of growing up. In other words then, the differences in groups to a good extent is the result of the kind of learning experiences they have encountered. So, if you want to create group differences, what do you create? You create differences in their what? Learning experiences. That is why the European, in order to create the African man, must also restrict the African experience, must restrict the kinds of experiences you have. Because an experience is not just an emotional kind of, of situation, it is a learning situation. An experience becomes often a permanent part of the personality. So you must see experience as learning, okay, not just uh, an emotional uh, a a effect, but as a learning. When you're in a classroom, you are having an experience. We call that experience learning, but nevertheless, it's an experience. Any kind of experience can be a learning situation. So consequently, if, we, if the European is to produce group differences in behavior, he then must have control over the experiences people have, uh, 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 undergo. And therefore, when they experience poor housing, when they experience poor food, non-nutritional food, when they experience poor schooling, when they experience uh, adverse economic circumstances, when they experience the degradation and scandalization of their character, when they experience the kinds of things we talk about here daily in this community, then you're going to get a difference in group behavior. And you will see then that this experience is deliberately designed to create a deliberate personality in black people. Some of you have heard me talk about the rat, and this, this social learning theory is based on what we call rat psychology. And it's very interesting, by the way, why in these psych books you have talk about rats and dogs. Because often the unaware African thinks that that's what the whole field is about, rats and dogs. Another consciousness controlling tool. And as soon as you mention conditioning, somebody will jump up, oh, the Pavlovian dog. Yeah. <laughs> Either they're going to immediately show you how smart they are in terms of the Pavlovian dog. <laughs> you see? <laughs> and how smart they are about the rat and, and you know, the skin of ox. But if you talk them for, to them for a whole night, they never quite get around to how it is that we are the Pavlovian dog. <laughs> and that we are the rat. We never see that part. And yet, look at it, ladies and gentlemen. When we talk about the so-called skin of rat, it's a rat taken out of its natural habitat, placed in a box. It is placed in a condition, a new set of conditions, a new environment. It's going to have experiences in that box it has never had before in its life. It must learn to survive in that box and cope with that box. It must learn to push that lever in order to eat. It has never had to do that before. Never. But it's got to learn. It's got to learn that when the yellow light comes on, it can push the lever and get food. But when the green one comes on, no food is coming. It has to learn that it can get food every time it pushes the lever, or to get food every fifth time it pushes the lever, or every fifteenth time it pushes the lever, or to get food every five minutes, and you can just manipulate its behavior around and around and around. Uh, the experimenter says, okay, you're not going to get eat until you hit the bar five times, fifteen times. And sometimes you can see the rat even learns that, you know. It just doesn't hit the food sometimes steadily. You may hit it fast fifteen times. or 
the experiment is saying, I'm going to feed you every five minutes, regardless of how many times you hit the bar. And that rat will get a sense of time. <laughs> Toward the end of that five minutes, then it'll start hitting the bar. You see? And you can manipulate and change this behavior in terms of how you're going to reward it and how you're going to punish it. It knows something now, and it behaves now in a way that no other rat behaves. <laughs> it has learned something new. Why? Because it has been placed under a set of conditions. It has learned to adjust to those conditions and to cope with those conditions. If it went back to its natural habitat, it would be a strange rat, I'm telling you. And we know sometimes how so-called tamed animals, as a result of their social interaction with human beings, are unable to even survive in their natural environment because of the way they've, they've uh, had to survive in their natural environment. And so what we recognize in the Skinner experiment is this, that the rat not only lives in a condition and in an environment, the environment and the condition does what? Lives in the rat. And the rat is an expression of its environment. As a matter of fact, the environment and condition speak through the rat and literally uses its body to express itself. And this is why often we can hear some people talk the way they dress, the way they walk, and tell where they're from. <laughs> <laughs> because we not only live in a neighborhood, ladies and gentlemen, the neighborhood does what? It lives in us. It expresses itself through us. We are its vehicle. It comes out through us. So consequently, when another people shape your neighborhood, and they shape your schools, and they shape the experiences you will have, they are in the process then of creating us as human beings. We have to recognize that. This is why the black student has to look at the rat, not as a rat, but as a prototype of himself. And if he does not see that rat that way, he's been miseducated. I don't care how many A's he makes equal to the white boy, he has been miseducated. And yet the white man has sat right there and told him exactly how he's doing. <laughs> exactly. No, no, no bones about it. And I have to tell my students then, look at this rat and this experimenter, not from the point of view of the way it's written in the book. So consequently, when another people shape your neighborhood and they shape your schools and they shape the experiences you have, they are in the process then of creating us as human beings. We have to recognize that. This is why the black student has to look at the rat not as a rat, but as a prototype of himself. And if he does not see that rat that way, he's been miseducated. I don't care how many A's he makes equal to the white boy, he's been miseducated. And yet the white man has sat right there and told him exactly how he's doing. <laughs> exactly. No, no, no bones about it. And I often tell my students then, look at this rat and this experimenter, not from the point of view of the way it's written in the book, but look at it as a power relationship. The experimenter is able to create the behavior in this rat as a result of the power that the experimenter has over it. Because there's a power differential there, isn't it? Yeah, there's a power differential there. Look at it as a political situation where the experimenter has control over when that at rat is going to eat, how it's going to eat, what it's going to eat, when it's going to get fed, and all of the other things. And through the manipulation of those things, manipulates the rat's behavior, but ultimately creates its personality. And then I go back and say, let us see then in your own community, who controls your water? Who controls your food? Who controls your jobs? Who controls your symbols, your status symbols? Who controls the pay? And you will recognize then that through this control and through the power over vital things like food and water and shelter and jobs, we are created as a people. Through the vital ability of this white man as the experimenter to reinforce the kind of behavior he wants to reinforce and to punish the kind of behavior he wants to punish, he creates 
black people and African people are well over. And it's not black people in America, it's black people in the Caribbean, it's black people in South America, it's black people in Africa and Asia and wherever you find them. When he says, I'm not going to give you this loan this time. <laughs> or, starve your people, but you got to pay Chase Manhattan Bank. Oh, you mean your people are going to rise up in rebellion? Well, we'll send you aid in the form of police weapons so you can shoot them down in the streets as they riot about the price of rice because you got to pay us. And therefore, you become a bill collector for the system itself. And therefore, the monies that you can use to build schools and other things for your children now must be used to feed the fat cats. And therefore, the children are made ignorant, and the children are, are made without education, and the economy lags, and a whole social political system is created that ultimately works itself into the very personality of the people in that system. And those people, to a good degree, then, are created. It is only then when we begin to look at these situations from that point of view that these sort of bland lessons you see here have real meaning for us as people. And so what we're saying here then, ultimately, when we look at the so-called so social learning theory, we're saying then that it is the nature of the social relationships between men, between people, that to a good degree helps to determine the characteristics of us as persons and as groups and, and as people as a whole. That is why we must be concerned about the nature of the social relationships we have with other people. Now then, this is a preface and I, I, uh, to the induction of self-hatred. And we're going to continue it as a uh, short, and I'm going to end short of it. I just want us to understand what we're dealing here. It's not enough to say that uh, the whites induce self-hatred into us. I want us to see how this is achieved through the power and the ability of the white man to manipulate reinforcements, the ability of the white man, an ability that we to a good a degree has uh, let him have unchallenged, to, to manipulate reinforcement that is going to make our self-hatred possible. Because we just don't hate ourselves uh, by accident. That hatred is deliberately induced because it serves a political, social, economic purpose. But that self-hatred cannot come about merely in terms of what white folks say about us, the, the white attitudes toward us. It must be related to power. It must be backed up by the ability to punish and the ability to reward. And therefore, what is said when it is combinated with power then becomes the vehicle through which self-hatred is induced. I'm going to, in the, in the following lectures then, look at the various means by which self-hatred is deliberately induced in black people. We're going to talk, uh, I'll, I'll list uh, some of them right quickly to indicate where we're going. And we'll talk a bit about the first one here. The association of innate personal group characteristics with negative ass assignations. We're going to talk about, if, you, if that's not enough, that is, if creating self-hatred through just making a person's innate characteristics uh, negative, or be, be perceived as negative, then one creates the characteristics. In other words, you create the characteristics that you hate. And this often happens, of course, in parental relationships and other relationships, where, in a sense, you make the person into something. You make them a thief, and then you hate them for being a thief. You see, and to a good extent, what has happened to the, the African personality is he's created, a character is created so that that character can be hated, so that that character can be used as a justification for exploitation and misuse and abuse. And we want to look then at uh, that method and that technique. Uh, and, and, and this is quite a complicated one, followed up by, you, you can by the fact that you can induce self-hatred through what we call making positive, desirable characteristics unattainable, therefore creating an inferior to complex self-negation uh, through social comparison. And so forth, white. 
and make it only attainable by whites, then you induce self-hatred by those people who cannot make themselves white. And so often then one of the ways of creating self-hatred in an individual is putting those things that will get him out of that self-hatred out of his reach. And we will see that that is one of the methods. To create a reverse mentality and behavior and to create desires by punishing the right orientation and by rewarding the wrong orientation. In other words, we're going to talk about how the black personality is reversed and turned backwards so that uh, the individual will, will almost, uh, by habit, produce backward behavior. We're going to talk about this producing of backwardness, which produces frequent failures or, uh, goes, or, or success by accident which produces a, a feeling of cursedness. We're going to also then talk about de-individuation as a method of, of creating self-hatred. That is, reducing the individual's concept of, of, of uh, himself as an individual. Also, the creation of maladjustment through a number of techniques. The, uh, in our next section, then, we're going to look at the first segment here, the association of innate ethnic personal characteristics with negative assignations. You will see in the Bible itself that Adam, in this mythological account, is given control over creation by being given the power to name and classify all that is on the earth. In a sense, when God tells Adam that he is, that it is his prerogative to name and classify, he symbolically now is giving him control over the earth. The ability to name and define is a very powerful ability. And one of the major powers that the European has that we have got to take back is the European power of definition, of naming and determining what uh, is real and what is unreal. One of the constants that I talk about, that is, I often try to get across the idea that despite how much things appear to change, they remain the same. And that we as people must not be deceived by superficial change. That often superficial change is deliberately created as a way of maintaining fundamental sameness. You must look at the real power relationship between Europeans and Africans. That is the key. And you must question whether that power relationship has changed at all over the past four or five hundred years. You just cannot look at the idea that you're now, now in slavery and say that means we have advanced in some sort of way. Or that now we have certain job opportunities open to us, educational opportunities that open to us, that now we can eat at the same counter with white folk and all of this kind of stuff as indicative of basic fundamental change. As a matter of fact, to a good extent, these changes have been diversions to keep us from seeing that the very fundamental relationship between blacks and whites has not changed at all. I've often said that you may marvel about how now you can get a degree in computer technology and how this was not available to your forefathers. But remember that your forefathers as slaves also had skills. They just did not chop cotton and work in the households. They were skilled craftsmen as slaves. And in fact, at the end of, 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 of slavery, there were more black craftsmen and skilled craftsmen in some areas than there were whites. But what was the fundamental relationship? The fundamental relationship was, was that these skilled slaves worked for the benefit and power of their masters. And that fundamental relationship has not changed one whit today, ladies and gentlemen. You do computer engineering, but you're going to do it for IBM, and you're going to do it for GE, and you're going to do it for some white man ultimately. It's the same game, ladies and gentlemen. You may hang out in the same office. You may even marry them. You may even sleep with them. You may eat with them. But the fundamental power relationship is what? Still the same. Still the same. This hasn't changed. And the thing you have to look at then is, are not those superficial changes, 
but the fundamental relationship. And there are several of them that you will see have existed for the past three, four, five hundred years and that are still pretty much where they are today. And that even integration and even assimilation and even at the eating at the same lunch counter and even the electing of black men to office and black women to office, even the electing of one to the presidency of the United States is going to serve the same function to maintain the ultimate power of the white man over the black man. And therefore you cannot be deceived by those things. And this comes out of this ability of this white man to name and create definition. One of the books I would recommend for the reading list is the book White Over Black by Winthrop Jordan, a very uh, copiously de uh, detailed book, and one I think you should uh, certainly read, and I'll be indicating some others, of course. And this one I'm sure is still around. I don't know whether this one is available in the general market. Yes, and we have some of them here. The Negro's Image in the South by Claude H. Nolan, L-O-L-E-N, The Anatomy of White Supremacy. And of course, the one that I intended to quote, uh, to quote from extensively tonight, Franz Fanon's book, Black Skin, White Mast, which I highly recommend that you read. And of course, while you're reading these now, read some others because they can be a bit depressing, but you, you, you want to you wanna look at them very closely. So, you know, read uh, Diop's African Contributions to Civilization, Pre-Colonial Africa, uh, uh, some uh, introduction to African civilizations by um, Jackson. Jackson and some of the others are sort of, uh, you know, <laughs> waited out a little bit. <laughs> but uh, don't neglect these things because what is being talked about here then is this. Now, what are, we, what are we getting at here? We're saying in order to produce self-hatred in the black man, the white man had to degrade all things African. And this has not changed. To be entered into these jobs that we gloat so much about, we literally have to become black white people, Amen. honorary white people. It literally requires the shedding of all that is African in us in order to gain these so-called jobs and these over black. Long before they found some men were black, Englishmen found in the idea, Englishmen found in the idea of blackness a way of expressing some of their most ingrained values. No other color except white conveyed so much emotional impact. As described by the Oxford English Dictionary, there's those of us who like to speak Oxford English, right? <laughs> <laughs> that indicates the degree to which we have been educated. The meaning of black before the 16th century included deeply stained with dirt. This is, this is the definer now. Soil dirty, foul, having dark or deadly purposes, malignant, pertaining to or involving death, deadly, baneful, disastrous, sinister. Isn't it interesting the most deadly dead people in the world <laughs> will project that deadness upon other people? The people who today threaten the earth with death, total death and annihilation, will make blackness appear to be the symbol of death and deadliness. But of course, ladies and gentlemen, in order for this people to rule, this must be the case. A reversal of values must take place so that the real culprit can hide his cupidities and the one who is victimized must see himself as guilty. And you can see it then built into the system. Foul, iniquitous, atrocious, horrible, wicked, indicating disgrace, censure, liability to punishment, etc. They weren't even through with that. All this, all this related to the word what? Blackness, Oxford English Dictionary, before the Englishman got, got over there, indicating, and it, and it goes on, blackness was an emotionally partisan color, the handmaid and symbol of baseness and evil, a sign of danger and repulsion. Embedded in the concept of blackness was its direct opposite. Because what are we saying here? If blackness is all these things, my, what, what must whiteness be? <laughs> and the contrast begins. And this, is, and this is the foundation when you let another people be a validator of reality. 
when you let a lot of people be the definer of what is good and what is bad, when you let another people name names, when you let another people write their dictionaries, when you let another people tell what this, what symbolizes something else, and then when you sit there and accept their authority, then you're going to accept self-hatred. And it's that acceptance of this white man has authority that is the foundation to a good extent of the acceptance of ourselves as an object of hate by ourselves. No other color so clearly implied opposition. And it, it goes on white and black connoted white and black connoted purity and filthiness, virginity and sin. Are you gonna get married in your white gown? <laughs> Virtue and baseness, beauty and ugliness, beneficence and evil, God and the devil. Is there, is there any accident that some of these people have these white Jesuses painted in the back of their churches? I keep telling you that these churches are going to take you to hell. It's the preachers that are going to take you to hell, ladies and gentlemen. If you walk into a church with the white Jesus painted in the, that auditorium, you're being lied to to your faces. And any preacher that puts a white Jesus in that church is a preacher that is already heading you to hell. Because he's disobeying the fundamental law that says, Thou shalt not build unto me any graven images. And God knows that when you start projecting images in terms of ethnic groups, it has a psychology about it that creates inferiority and self-hatred, and it makes those who are not a part of that ethnic group believe that that ethnic group is somehow divinely blessed and is godlike in its aspect. And many blacks believe in their heart of hearts that the white man is divine in yes. some sort of way. Yeah, that he has been divinely destined to rule over black people. Well, this is his world and we may as well adjust in it. Uh, well, you know, we, and so we accommodate this white man because the white man has usurped the image of divinity. And yet those of you who've read Ben Yarkonnen, those of you who've read the other black historians and read the true history of black, no, if you want to play this partisan game, this ethnic game, that the premier symbol of divinity was blackness. And therefore, the, the white man had to usurp that image and steal the image of divinity from black people. And there are many whites today who've stolen the image of divinity and the image of, of religion and so forth from black people. And the black people who do not know themselves then will be victimized by this usurpation and thievery. And we see it again happening in this particular instance. He goes on uh, to talk about then that uh, the, the European, that English discovery of black Africans, uh, let's, let's look at another thing here for a moment. Whiteness more would carry special significance for Elizabethan Englishmen. It was practic particularly when complemented by red the color of perfect human beauty, especially female beauty. This, deal, this ideal was already centuries old in Elizabeth's time, and their fair queen was its embodiment. Her cheeks were roses in a bed of lilies. Elizabeth was naturally pale, but like many ladies then and since, she freshened her lilies at the cosmetic table. An adoring nation knew precisely what a beautiful queen looked like. Her cheek, her chin, her neck, her nose, this was a lily, that was a rose. Her hand so white as whale's bone, her finger tipped with cassie dawn, her bosom sleek as Paris plaster, up, held up two bowls of alabaster. And they go on. <laughs> Not their white. <laughs> It was important, he goes on to say, if incalculably so, that, in the English, that English discovery of black African came at a time when the accepted standard of ideal beauty was a fair complexion of rose and white. Negroes not only failed to fit this ideal, but seemed to be the very picture of perverse negation. <laughs> so again, we see the, the uh, power of letting other people define who and what we are. We will see that if we do not organize ourselves as a majority in this world to take away the power of definition 
from this white man, we are going to suffer from self-negation and self-hatred throughout the time we, we do not get the courage to do so. We cannot let another people be our definer. In the book, The Negro's Image in the South, and it went on to say, in a democratic climate of opinion, slavery could be justified only by positing differences in the innate characteristics of the white and black races so great that the black race must appear to be incapable of freedom and thus destined to serve the white race forever. When the slaves were freed, men of the New South kept alive the pro-slavery thinking of their fathers, tinkering with it only to adjust it to altered conditions. Science, the scriptures, the experience of mankind, they still alleged, showed that black men were born to be servants. In this way, they reconciled democratic equality with servitude. In other words, how can you say all men are created evil and enslave other men? The only way you can do that then is to make those who are enslaved less than men. So in a democratic system, in order to maintain consistency, the white man then is forced to degrade the black person because he cannot justify, even according to his own constitution and theology and his own ideology, he cannot justify slavery. And therefore, he must reduce the humanity of black men in order to justify their servitude. In their effort to prove the Negro an inferior creature, white supremacists developed analogies supposedly derived from biology. This is why you call on science, like the science of psychology, which is used, of course, to justify what white people already think. So they found the Negro to have a thick head as a goat for absorbing blows, a skin that exuded copious perspiration with a distinctive stench, monkey-like arms, flat feet, a sensitive heel, a brutish physiognomy, all of which marked him as a creature useful for hard labor, but good for little else. The first step in this, in this foray into biology was to find the Negro mentally dull. And now you get the association you see between physiognomy and psychology. The size of your nose indicates the size of your brain. The size of your feet indicates the size of your mentality. This comes from letting other people define who and what we are. Then to hunt for uh, uh, physiological characteristics which explain this trait. At about the age of puberty, it was discovered there occurred a rapid thickening of the skull. And the animal portion of the brain then became supreme, ruling over the adult Negro organism. <laughs> This, this stunted cranial growth accounted for the black man's cultural immobility for thousands of years. In other words, that thick skull wouldn't let his brain grow bigger. <laughs> As he was at creation's dawn, so he remained without initiative, without inventiveness, without the ability to move forward. The Negro had, so it seemed, always known about his thick head. For untold centuries, he had used it as a weapon of attack. <laughs> as is the custom of rams. <laughs> this is the definer here. You, and, and now the projecting. You see what is happening here? The taking of the person's very innate characteristics and, and negating them. You see? The Negro's face, like his cranium, revealed a great deal to the racist biologist. It expressed the simplicity of animal existence. Round features, tropical eyes, whatever kind of eyes those are, <laughs> flashing smile, all marked the black man as tractable, emotional, intellectually torpid. Perhaps wrote a southern lady in 1878, an infusion of Caucasian blood would dissipate the simian type, improving the shape of the retreating forehead, changing the con contour of the jaw, and giving the weight and power to the inactive brain. And there's some Negroes who came to believe that one. And many of them believe that to this moment. And many of us are familiar with lifting up the race, which meant, of course, lightening it up. Don't you bring home that black man here to me. Remember that? Many mother's advice to a daughter. Don't marry one blacker than you, because of course there was that scale of measurement. Some specialists concentrated attention on the nose, the hair, the eyes, and the ears in the hope that they would find evidence of the inferiority of the black race. Every aspect of the physiognomy is attacked and scandalized. 
The black man's skin, the most obvious mark of inferiority, was to believe to possess certain peculiar qualities other than distinctiveness in color. It secreted oil which kept it in a state of shine, thus deflecting intense solar rays. <laughs> White science at its best here. The pigment carried heat into the system. They are driving water to the surface. <laughs> which, any, which in evaporation dissipated body heat. You know, I can still hear black people, well, you know, there are a lot of black people, there are a lot of heat. <laughs> the Negro made an excellent, the Negro made an excellent worker because he was, it was in, imminently a sweating animal. But this remarkable sweating capacity, however useful in the field, caused him to be a pariah in white society. Object objectionable in the jury box, the legislature, or the drawing room. During radical reconstruction, the sweetness of loyalty perfumed the air of legislature and political meetings, and white men held their nose. There's an irony there, of course. Right. The sweetness of loyalty perfumed the air, and the white men held their nose. I grew up in an era where often whites held their nose uh, and just went right on into the 50s and early 60s as, uh, as an indication of supposedly smell of black people, uh, a degradation of, um, of black people. The inclination of white Southerners was to believe that the mark of race was stamped upon every organ, upon the whole organism. I'm going to talk in a minute about the sexual organ and let's see what that meant. In assembling evidence to prove Negroes inferior, white Southerners faced the temptation to consign them to a lower order of creation. Some extremists drove Negroes to the very edge of the abyss, separating man from monkey. A few aberrant uh, Southern Negroes as apes. Such description came easily to an admirer of J.C. Knott's types of mankind, which he believed established beyond reasonable doubt the separate origin of Negroes and demonstrated that domesticated blacks reverted to wildness when left to themselves. And I've got to show later on, this belief is still inherent in many black people today. Many of us are afraid to turn the white man loose and to separate ourselves from the white man because we believe that left to ourselves, we will enter into the dark ages. That we, will, we, that we need the white man to organize our lives. That we need the white man to give us purpose and direction that if we didn't have the white man, we could not enjoy all of these so-called benefits of civilization and uh, so forth. So we see then that uh, this perception of blackness has, has worked its way into, the, uh, into the, the black psyche and is in part responsible for the creation of self-hatred. Let me just make one quick quotation, uh, another quotation from Black Over White called Dismemberment, Physiology, and Sexual Perception, which of course, as Rogers recognizes, at the very center, often, of the white man's relationship, particularly to the black man, that sexuality runs through that uh, relationship. The white man's fears of Negro sexual aggression were equally apparent in the use of castration as a punishment in the colonies. And were many of us familiar with the fact that many blacks, when they were lynched, were castrated. And many blacks today are, physical, uh, are psychologically castrated still. This weapon of desperation was not employed by angry mobs in the manner which became familiar after emancipation. In a few instances, particularly in the West Indies, individual planters emasculated their slaves, sometimes in outbursts of sadism involving hideous tortures, which planter society deplored but did not effectively control until the latter part of the 18th century. Far more significant, Castration was dignified by specific legislative sanction as a lawful punishment in Antigua, the Carolinas, Bermuda, Virginia, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey. It was sometimes prescribed for such offenses as striking a white person or running away until 1722. South Carolina legally required masses of slaves running away from the for the fourth time to have them castrated. And in 1697, the assembly ordered castration of three Negroes who had attempted to abscond through the Spanish in uh, St. Augustine. 
So we see here again the 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 degradation of the the very sexual organs of Black people. In some colonies, laws authorizing castration were worded so as to apply to all Negroes, whether free or slave. So you see, you don't escape castration regardless of your status, whether you're free or not. You're still open to it. As a legal punishment, castration was a peculiarly American experiment, but there was no basis for it in English law. Castration of Negroes clearly indicated a desperate, generalized need in the white man to persuade themselves that they were really masters in all ways masterful. And it illustrated dramatically the ease with which white men slipped over into treating their Negroes like their bulls and stallions whose spirit could be subdued by emasculation. In some colonies, moreover, the specific sexual aspect of castration was so obvious as to undermine how much, uh, much of the white man's insecurity vis-a-vis -vis the Negro was fundamentally sexual. And we can, we, we, we of course, see that up to uh, the, the uh, very uh, point today. Uh, and, and we can see this, an interesting little uh, thing here is brought out from the London, London News, Connecticut, February 20th past, I think this is in the 18th century. By certain information from a gentleman, we are, were assured that some weeks ago, to the westward of that place, a very remarkable thing fell out, which we here relate as a caveat for all Negroes meddling me uh, for the future with any white man, me uh, with, uh, with any white woman lest they fare with the like treatment. And it is this, a Negro man met abroad an English woman, which he accosted to lie with, stooping down, fearing none behind him. A man observing this design took out his knife before the Negro was aware, cut off all his unruly parts, smack and smooth. The Negro jumped up roaring and ran for his life. The black now an eunuch is alive and likely and like to recover of his wounds and doubtless cured from any more such wicked attempts. And John goes on to say, doubtless a cure for whom? A cure, of course, for the, the white man himself. The concept of the Negro's aggressive sexuality was reinforced by what was thought to be an anatomical peculiarity of the Negro male. He was said to possess an especially large penis. The idea was considerably older than the exegesis of Ham's offense against his father, offered by the West African traveler Richard Johnson in 1623. Indeed, the idea without question annotated the settlement of America and possibly even the Portuguese explorations of the West African coast. Several 15th century cartographers, those that uh, make maps, decorated parts of Africa with little naked figures, which gave the idea graphic expression. And in the course of, uh, in due course in the 17th century, English accounts of West Africans were carefully noting the extraordinary greatness of the Negroes' members, as it refers to. And we uh, will continue a bit again in, uh, in our next lecture when we look at Franz Fanon, when he talks about that the white man's encounter with the Negro, as he refers to it, is an encounter with the biological. And we meet again the, the assignations that are placed upon the very body of the black man. We must say then, in closing at this point, that it is not the fact that the white man degraded the black body that created self-hatred. It is not the scandalizing of the black character or the rewriting of black history so that black culture would appear to have, uh, have uh, contributed nothing to mankind or have nothing positive about it. In order for that, the degradation of the black body to be effectively realized into self-hatred, the black man had to accept what the white man said. He had to accept the values of the white man. He had to accept the white man's own criteria. If we did not accept it, if we 
did not believe it. If we did not use his value system and his concept of beauty, then we would not have been victimized by his scandalous descriptions of us as a people. If we had been careful to note our own emotional reactions, and I will demonstrate next week that it is the emotional reaction that we have to what the white man says. It is our anger. It is our lack of confidence, our doubt, our fears that are the vehicles that gets this image that the white man projects into our psyche <coughs> and from that that we are engaged in self-hatred. It means then that in order to prevent self-hatred from implanting its roots in the black psyche, we do not have to convert the white man. We do not have to see and, and try to get his children to love our children. We do not have to integrate and assimilate. We do not have to deny our color. We do not have to become some kind of abstraction and tell people just to look at me as a man, don't see my color. <laughs> it means that we have within our own personality, within our own self, the ability to determine whether what the white man says is going to make us self-hating or not. And it is that aspect that I want to look at in this series. What is it that we can do? What is it that we have within our power to remove this curse of self-hatred and to remove then the resultant tendencies toward self-defeat? And we want to look at those methods and, and, and develop those methods for, uh, for, uh, for getting over this attempt of the, of the white man to bring about hatred. At this point then we will open the floor for discussion and uh, for comment. Yes. What, what are two or three things that we can do based on this session here mm -hmm. that would enable us to begin to reverse mm -hmm. some of the things that you covered? This session? Okay, and please note then now that we do have uh, special sessions for a detailed discussion of those issues you just you, you just raised. So we we won't go into them uh, prematurely. At the, for this session though. I would advise, as I did advise early, earlier, that uh, we read into the literature that I've just mentioned here today. And I know many of you already have Fanon's book. I think you should review that book again. Uh, and of course, look through the book that I just mentioned. Uh, and uh, look deeply into those books. And not only just read them intellectually, but uh, read them intuitively and read them with uh, a certain amount of feeling. Uh, get a, a, a psychological sense of, of what is being projected here and get a sense of how in the context of totalitarian control uh, over black people, particularly during slavery and reconstruction and so forth, uh, get an idea of how this, uh, these concepts uh, became a part of the black psyche. In other words, strive for understanding uh, on an emotional level, more so than just on an intellectual level. In another context, I'm going to talk about brainwashing. I did a few lectures uh, last year on brainwashing, and I'm going to reinstitute those lectures because it's very important that we look at the slave camp as a brainwashing factory, that we look at it pretty much the way we look at a prisoner of war camp, where people now are being brainwashed. And I'm going to show <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> how the relationships that uh, uh, in, 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 inhered between whites and blacks in slavery uh, were pretty much the same kind of relationships that inhere in a brainwashing situation, where there is a complete cr control of information and a complete, complete control of the environment, where the brainwasher becomes almost the sole source of information and the sole interpreter of reality and how he restructures reality, restructures history, restructures concepts in such a way that the person, if he accepts these reconstruction, accepts his conversion into a new being. 
and we we then in another context are going to look at how this is accomplished. So when you read these books, then read them with an idea of this totalitarian kind of situation, where to a good extent the information that is being received by our people, the concept of reality is being pretty much a reality and information projected from the white man, and how then that that perception is going to inculcate itself often into the minds of African people. And think too how often uh, our emotional reactions to these insults of our personality are going to lay the foundation ultimately for us accepting it. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> in, in, in the example you gave of the rat and um, him eating when he knows how to push this button, mm -hmm. um, is it a fact that eventually they change mm -hmm. after he becomes con uh, conditioned to this mm -hmm. and he changes this? Mm -hmm. So doesn't this really make a, sort of a crazy rap so that something else enters in? Oh, uh, quite so, quite so. It, in fact, often in, um, in psychology we talk about experimental neurosis and these very techniques have been used to deliberately create uh, neurotic raps. Uh, and, and rats that are, for all purposes, psychotic. And, uh, you know, I've often said, uh, and I'll say again, that in order for us to be in the condition we're in, we have to be crazy. And I, I mean that literally. We have to be crazy. We have been made crazy. We have been in contact with a crazy people. One of the things that we have failed to realize is that we are dealing with a pathological group of people. And their pathology <laughs> has been passed on to us. See, one of the major games that's run in self-hatred is that the pathological person is perceived as being normal. And the victim of his pathology is perceived as being the crazy one, you see. And often what happens, we, uh, we fail to look at the pure craziness and madness of this man we call a white man the pure insanity of this human being. As a matter of fact, a part of the game is to make us see his insanity as virtue, and to see his insanity as goodness, and to see his threat to the world as somehow indicative of his greatness. To see this person who has the whole world polluted, to see this person who has the whole world wondering when it is going to be brought to a deadly and fiery end, to see this person as representing our malice and to see ourselves as representing the opposite. And we will see that the rat behavior that, uh, that you create neurosis in animals by creating contradictions, by, and, and there are particular ways of doing it, by manipulating their rewards and punishments in, in such a way that uh, they cannot differentiate right from wrong, up from down. You can, you can drive them crazy. For instance, if you get a, a rat to respond to an ellipse, you see, and then so that each time uh, an ellipse is projected, it reacts in a certain sort of way. And each time a circle is projected, it reacts in a different way. But you can keep changing that ellipse little by little so it begins to look more and more like a circle. So that the animal at the wild doesn't know what to do. It's paralyzed. It literally goes crazy. It, 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 it breaks, it, it, its mind becomes disorganized. And we will see that the foundation for driving anyone crazy to a good extent is the projection of contradictions. Getting them caught between contradictions. The contradiction of being born black and African and seeing that as the essence of evil and dirtiness and impurity. And yet to be what? Stuck with it. And then how does one get out of it? How does one cope with it? One quick hand and I'll be back. Yeah, I've been joking myself a lot of times and I'm into me. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, listen to you talk at the very beginning of your lecture. And I felt a little bit ashamed because you said that we have to elevate. I have friends of mine who tell me, Lee, you've got to think collectively. <clears throat> but how do you think of the drug pushers on Lennox Avenue as collect? How can, how can you think of them as, as, as me? Mm -hmm. well, I don't want to have any part of them. How can you think of them as people who, 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 uh, people who, who, who um, masquerade as pillars of the community who mm -hmm. finance these drug things? Mm -hmm. that you see? I see it every day. Little kids walking through, to, you know, holes in the walls and putting their money in and get the drugs. Now, how can I? Because again, I'm strong. 
But I, I don't have the, the knowledge that you have, and I'm sure a lot of other people have, and I, I, I'm strong enough to keep it away from me physically. I don't like it, mm -hmm. and I don't like being able to have to include them mm -hmm. in a we thing. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, I understand. Okay. I just have to say okay. that's emotional, but that's real. No, yes, very much. And it is an aspect that uh, we I will discuss in, in uh, about the third lecture. I do plan, because uh, in, those, in that lecture, I will begin to deal with how we, the many ways we have uh, tried to cope with that self-hatred. You can't intellectualize with No, you no, and one of the ways, mm -hmm. and, that, and one of the ways, of course, that we try to cope with it is through, of course, the use of uh, drugs. However, and, and so I'm going to leave that for a little later time, but however I want to say that the foundation of bringing about changes is, in a sense, to see them as us and to see them as a part of us and representing a us. Thing to do. Because to a good degree, the engaging of our children in drug behavior has to be laid at our feet and has to be laid at the fact that we choose to try to separate and alienate these people from ourselves uh, as people. Wow. Uh, the behaviors of, uh, we will see later on when we talk about criminality, that uh, a good deal of the responsibility for the criminal behavior of our people falls in the hand of other black communities. Well, does a criminal need to think of just eliminating like you do a cancer? Not necessarily, but it depends on the way you plan to eliminate them. <laughs> well, that might be, that, that, is, a, that is a solution. Because, you know, along with every society, you've got to have a king, you've got to have intellectuals, you've got to have the warriors, and you've got to have the democrats. You understand what I'm trying to say to you? Now, that all has to be tempered with self-love. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting concept. I won't, I, I won't go into it right now, because... Strangely enough, that's not necessarily an African concept. Okay, I apologize. Uh, no, 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 uh, relative position one to the other. And yet when you study African history and older history, you will see that that definitely was not the case. And what you will see often is that to the degree men became hierarchical, they also became destructive. That there is almost a direct relationship between hierarchical mm -hmm. structures and strict, rigid caste structures mm -hmm. and destructiveness uh, in mankind. We'll have to say that for a little later on. Certainly, the direct eliminate, elimination of people who threaten the life blood of the community is a is a consideration we cannot overlook and we must take seriously. But of course, while you are thinking of that, you have to think too that you're going to have to confront the police force as well, because a part of the idea is that if you're going to get control of your community, you're going to find out that it's going to be white law, quote unquote that you're going to have to fight most of all. I've often told many black people, when you when you ultimately decide to take control of the community, you're going to find out that it's the police that you're going to have to fight first. And now when we talk about this, then we're going to have to talk about this in a in a broader context. Yes, sir. Uh, stand up uh, uh, so we can. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing is what we have to do is look at uh, the situation of uh, mainland China. They have prostitutes and drug sellers and so on in the media. And first thing Milo here would try to educate them. This is what uh, Dr. Amos is doing right now. It's your job to do that. Well, see, but I'm not equipped to educate, but I don't have the basis of education. Well, education doesn't mean uh, on intellectual consent. Just to be an example. You, 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 you educate somebody, just walk them through not doing what they're doing. Well, I do that every day. Okay, so that's education. So first, I think the first thing you have to do is educate the people. <laughs> then, if that, all that failed, then you can do something like Milo's here. Uh, mm -hmm. my, my question was, though, uh, read an article. <laughs> The New York Times magazine on Sunday. They dealt with the situation happening in Japan right now. Uh, the Western world seems to be very concerned. The Japanese now are looking for their soul, searching for their soul. Mm -hmm. They're going back to the so called minority Japanese, which are basically darker mm -hmm. type Japanese. Mm -hmm. uh, they are now, there's, there's a group, either a mindset in Japan now, uh, where they're talking about reevaluating Japanese education so they can become. They could, be, they could be Japanese side, in mm -hmm. turn. Uh, they are talking about uh, rejecting European values and mm -hmm. values and things like that. 
Yes, I, 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 I looked at that. Uh, yes, uh, certainly that's not only the situation in uh, Japan, but uh, some article came out during the week uh, in, in reference to uh, Korea uh, as well. Because, of course, it points up to the fact that all, all people have to face when they're changing social and political systems. And particularly when often that change is foisted upon them by outside forces. Of course, when we read Japanese history, we'll see, in a sense, the Japanese, the Japanese are literally forced into the Western uh, uh, orbit. I think it's through Admiral Perry and there's a lot of people who literally, uh, yeah, and literally break into that system. And while superficially the Japanese have adapted to it well, technologically, uh, now they begin to realize that there's a psychological price to be paid for uh, getting caught up in the Western system. And now they have to confront uh, the contradictions between developing West West, so-called Western technology, business economic practices, and, and, and the contradiction between uh, engaging in those things and the, the contradiction of becoming Westernized Again, in a sense, you're dealing with an issue, too, of self-hatred that's beginning to creep up. To what extent can they participate in the so-called Western sense and not ultimately be overtaken by Western values, which to a degree means the negation of their own and ultimately means the negation of them often as Japanese and their self-image of themselves uh, and their image of themselves as people. We saw even a bit of this in Vietnam where some Vietnamese women uh, undertook operations to round out their eyes, you see, and, and start bringing uh, different facial features. And so what you have here, again, is a problem that we've been talking about earlier that's not only relevant to black people, but that is a general problem, and that is the problem of what happens to a person psychologically, what happens to a people psychologically when they begin to take over the values and orientations of another people or when they thoughtlessly in a way start adjusting to the demands of other people. This adjustment is bought at a price and often that price is the rejection of self and the loss of a sense of self and now they're confronting it. The other thing that uh, is apparent was apparent in that piece uh, was also the fact that now the Japanese are beginning to be pressured by the United States. They've succeeded too well, you see. Mm -hmm. they, they, they have the United States in debt. Mm -hmm. the, they, the United States is telling them you got this big trade deficit. <laughs> You're gonna have to, to no. reduce this deficit in some sort of way or else we're gonna block you out from this country. And while the Japanese success story has been one we all look at uh, with some degree of admiration and maybe some other emotion, we must recognize though that the Japanese system is, is essentially an exporting system. And, and therefore it is oriented toward the United States market. And when that market begins to close itself to the Japanese, it has very dire economic consequences, very much a similar consequence in principle that African countries have as well. But note how the Japanese are dealing with it. They are trying to deal with it, not in terms of whitening up themselves, but of what? Rediscovering themselves and restructuring their image and their values, which I think is an interesting approach as against, I think, uh, an approach often among many of our people where the pressure is dealt with by a continuing denial of self and a, a trying to, to get away and an escape from the self. So in a sense, some Japanese see their salvation as a return to that Japanese-ness as against getting rid of it. And so, Snitchy, one, one quick statement then, we have to move on to the other question. I don't want to comment. Uh -huh. There's one piece in there that I wanted to see a dialogue between African mm -hmm. people in this country, Japanese people. Mm -hmm. In this particular author, I think it's Jew, an article was written in the sense to try to show how this, this, uh, how this can go to the extreme. Mm -hmm. this, this search for identity, this search to, to get rid of the self hatred, this mm -hmm. search to get rid of the Eurocentric. Uh, can, live, can, 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 can lead to a, uh, a 
uh, extreme. Mm -hmm. and, and what he was, in his point, was really a negative point about a lot of them. And what the Japanese themselves were becoming because mm -hmm. this extreme nationalism. Mm -hmm. That can happen, and I have seen it happen among us. Mm -hmm. Extreme nationalism. Yes. Uh, you, you yourself become a racist. Uh, not that Sony just made a racist statement. Not that he's a sweet one of the supporters of going back to the Japanese aspect of that. So what I want to see is that I was studying, I was searching for knowledge, I was trying to get rid of our self-negation, self-defeat attitude. Is, is there a day that we too can can become extreme, can become racist, can become, uh, you know, not have the, the, the humane outlook in, mm -hmm. in, in the situation? Certainly. Can become too much uh, about self only. Is there certainly. a danger in that? Certainly, certainly. In fact, one of the results uh, which we'll be discussing uh, as we go on, uh, of uh, self-hatred and of this thing that I talk about tonight is extreme self-centeredness, you see, in, in, many, in many sort of ways, uh, and uh, extreme uh, egotism. I'm going to talk later on about de-individuation and, and, and how it reduces awareness and how that creates problems. I will talk also about uh, one of the compensatory reactions to self-hatred, and that is what I call pseudo-nationalism, which sort of war to as well, and it is coming back uh, uh, in disguise again. I'm looking at it too in the guise of the fact that a lot of black people think that it is to our advantage to prove to white people that we are as smart as they are. And there's that whole concept of whether black people are innately dumb, you know, centered around this concept of the IQ. And you see a lot of black people putting a lot of energy into trying to prove right. to whites, you know, about the cultural, the cultural biasness of white IQ tests. And, and there is that idea that if we can ever convince them that we are as smart as they are, then they're going to love us. <laughs> That's it. That's it. It's the thing that I wanted people a long time ago with. Uh, and that is the idea that our innate dumbness is used to justify our, our exploitation. However, the day that we prove that we are as smart as they are, are smarter, we are still going to catch hell. Mm -hmm. You see, so at one point when the West could laugh at Japan and laugh at any non-white group has been innately less smart, then of course it felt good about itself and it used that rationalization to, to uh, uh, exploit those people. And now the Japanese have come, come up to show that they are even smarter. Has that gotten them off the hook? No. Nah, not at all. It set them up again for another kind of, of competitive destruction. And now what I'm trying to say to black people, the day you prove that you're as smart as white people, the game is still going to go on. So you have to recognize at the center of the whole IQ ability debate is genocide. And that it's going to be genocide either way you go. Whether you t whether you're dumb, it's then we have the right to kill you and exploit you and use you like a dumb animal. Or if you're smart, we're going to kill you because then you may advance over the, uh, over the way we do. Just to even it out a little bit here. Uh, over in the... Yes. Yes, yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. We, yes. Go ahead. I'd like to say that I hope the day will come when we as a people get to the point that we do not press down or depress or negate one aspect of our community mm -hmm. in order to lift up the other. And I make reference to what you, to your um, statement about the church. I happen to be the pastor of an African Methodist mm -hmm. Church in Dover. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of the churches that we as black people own, we mm -hmm. bought from people who were not black. Mm -hmm. And many times those white pictures of Jesus were there when we got there. All right. uh, a lot of the younger members of ministers in the church, and I am one of them, um, young in terms of the year, try to get the parishioners to read the scriptures and bring something to the worship service so that the church becomes a community and not a dictatorship. However, we fail in that sorely. But if the people did read, and know about what you say about the images, then they can participate. And in settings like this, what we need to do is draw from this intelligence to go into the church and try to help it be what it is. If it were not for the black church, organized black church, then we will have we would never have had any place to express ourselves and choose go so I definitely discuss here. And I would make I would refer you to um, Dr. James Cone 
is an African Methodist Episcopal preacher mm -hmm. and a professor of systematic theology at Union Theological Seminary, where I study. Mm -hmm. so I wish we could get to the point okay. where we no longer push down what's mm -hmm. good or mm -hmm. what we don't like in order to build up something else. Let's lift us up without pushing down. Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate your uh, comments, and I certainly take them in the spirit that you uh, you gave them. I'd like to indicate, by the way, I was born into the African Methodist Church and was a member of that church, and, and I don't mean just a member, I was an active part of that church for for many years. And, uh, and uh, for me, with this history, of course, the history of Richard Allen, I'm familiar very much with this educational mission and the, uh, and I contributed to its educational farms. I'm familiar with its, its schools, and of course, uh, and my family still are African Methodist uh, today. So it's a church uh, as a denomination that certainly I, that still has some concrete well, relationships. Not, no, no, I, I, I just want to indicate to you that when I make statements about, as I made earlier, you know, that is not outside of the context of my own uh, intimate relationship to the black church. And also, of course, my own uh, history as far as the church with uh, Martin Luther King. But when you uh, say that the, the preachers are leading you straight to hell, and you don't justify that, you just throw it out and hang it. Yes. Okay. All right. Fine. Fine. No problem. No problem. No problem. No problem with that. I. But the context in which I made that statement was that when you have a preacher with a white Jesus, and I really don't care whether you bought it from white folk or not, because you have the ability to paint over that white picture. Now, and there is no excuse. There, there, is, there is no excuse. There is no excuse for having a white Jesus. There is no excuse for having a white Jesus painted in a white church, we got in a, in a church, regardless of where one bought it from, and I will state again very clearly, any black preacher preaching before a white painted Jesus is misleading black people. And this is the fact that I'm not going to deny it. I, I, uh, As a black preacher, I would not be before a congregation. I would not be before a congregation that demanded that a white Jesus stay behind me in the pulpit. And in your just a moment, in in, in your scripture, in, in, in your in, in your in, in your in your scripture. In, in, hold, on, let's, hold on, hold on a minute, ladies and gentlemen. Let, let's, let's just, let's just, in, in, yes, you are, and we're not going to deny that. In, in your scripture, in your scripture, the Christian is also admonished not to yield to temptation. The Christian is also admonished to turn himself away from sinful things. And if, if this Christ being painted in this church is a sinful thing, because as I said, it violates the rules, of the church itself and of the teachings of the religion itself, then I think it is a personal obligation of a minister not to be a part of that system. It is. I, yes. But the Lord doesn't yep. make a distinction between the Christian and the minister. He says that if any of us know what is wrong and we do it anyhow, mm -hmm. then we are sinners. That yes. means the responsibility is spread out, sir. I can agree with that. And so, I but, understand that, but he's human or she's human, and, she's, and he or she is subject to error. Mm -hmm. However, it is the it is the minister's duty. It is the minister's duty to instruct, to teach, to use that Bible to illustrate very clearly that 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 this this kind of image in the church is not justified. The if the minister should the members should be in some way made to see that there is no biblical basis for that kind of image in the church right. and, 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 right. and, and this has to, has to continue because if this is not the case the members believing in that kind of image even though they believe in it sincerely even though they do a lot of good works will still because of belief in that false image will still more than likely end up in the wrong place. Professor, with your knowledge mm -hmm. and who has graduated 
to your level did not train you. You did some of this thinking of your own. And right. so ministers have not been trained, all of them, to the same level that they ought to be trained in order to do everything right. That but I'm so saying what nothing is perfect. Doing? It all Fine. requires improving all the time. Yes. That's why I'm talking. That's why I'm making my I'd like to follow up on that kind of question. I'm reasonably well aware that when you touch the nerve that holds us prisoner, you're going to get a reaction that you didn't expect. <laughs> I find that when we touch on religion, it has been a source of our escape mechanism from reality. You will not find that most of us are prepared to acknowledge that the white man has duped us through our preachers. And no preacher on this earth can tell you that he has so much faith in his God, in his religion, to, if I was to ask anyone in here that they have faith in their God, in as much as they say that they can move mountains with their faith, I'd ask them to move that. And if they could not move that, I would classify them as a liar. I would also say that they are brainwashed and they're trying to pass it on. But since I'm not going to take that position, I'm going to ask you, why isn't that creature here that you speak of? Why is the creature? Talk to me. I can defend anything you have to say. It is said in your Corinthians, thou suffer a woman not to teach, nor preach, nor to have that authority of the man. And as a result, if you believe in your Bible, you are in contradiction of it. I believe in Jesus Christ, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Black or white? That's his word. Black or white? That's his word. Black or white? Spirit. God is the spirit, and they Black or white? Black or white. and I readily agree with you. But then that picture that sits up there that represents that European must come down. <laughs> Okay, I didn't say we, that you did. I said because he has no uh, color. Can we get on? That picture up there that represents the European just taken down. Okay. And I'll come to your church. All right. Okay. <laughs> but I'm going to get this from you. I just want to make 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 one point. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm, I was talking to some friends mm -hmm. who, who I thought had been friends for many years. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were talking about the oppression they have in their job because of racism. And I said, well, you know, we have to understand that we're African people. And they said, well, I'm not African. Oh, I'm so I said, Luz, you can say that because, you know, your background. But I'm Indian. One said you're Indian. Got <laughs> Indian in the family. And the other one said they have Irish. And they just went on. And then I began to realize that, you know, we're very sick. Yeah. We don't know who we are. And if we can't even unite on who we are, that's why we have all these arguments. Right. We couldn't have any argument if we understand that we're an African people. When I have, when I have two young, they're not young anymore. They're young women in college now. But when they were little, I took them to a church. And they had a little picture on it, and it had Jesus, and he was white. And my daughter says, me, mommy, Jesus is white? And I said, no. I said, Jesus is not white. So I went to the man in the school, you know, in the... Um, place and I said to him you know as my daughter came to me and said to me that Jesus was white I said and you have this on the um, little pamphlet that Jesus is white and he said to me that well we can't change it because this is what the Methodists give us and this is what we have to use and I said they gave it to you if that's the only thing you could have don't use it yes yes you and I left the church because they continue you indicate and you indicate there that that we have some control because of course I'm familiar with the Episcopalian kind of church and with the so-called discipline and with often the 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 Sunday school materials and other materials often coming from the top down and of course we we have to familiarize ourselves too with the fact that often what we call the church uh, and we have to face the fact is something that to a good degree uh, was imposed upon us by our white slave masters whether we want to whether we want to face that or not this issue that we have to confront. And we have to confront it within the context that the church is an institution and that every institution created by slave masters, whether it was the church, the family, the legal system, whatever system, is designed to keep black people in bondage. Hey, no. And the church is no exception. That, that, that does not, 
that does not deny the goodness that the church has done in terms of black people to believe. Believe me, when we talk, we're not talking about blacks and white, but we want to keep in mind this business of institutions. I'm, I was happy to for that church to be called the African Methodist Church. Just as I was happy when Elijah Muhammad called his sect the what? Black Muslims, which seemed to me to indicate then that even though I may have gotten this whole concept of Methodism from a foreign people, who in, in essence would have used and still used that Methodism as a means of maintaining my people under control. I will Africanize it or use it for the advancement of African people and therefore I will dis not disconnect my Africanness from this religious structure. And I can appreciate that in the church. But often too I find uh, in the Bible it says uh, what? Narrow is the way that leads to hell and, and straight and broad, uh, what is it? <laughs> narrow is the way that goes to heaven and narrow is the way. And we must admit as, as Jesus implied and other people imply that that broad way to hell is going to be led by false prophets and by people who come in the guise of preachers and people who come in the guise of religious teachers. That is, that is, that is a major aspect of, of the church and we have to look at it for what it is. We also fail to look at the real teachings of Jesus Christ. A lot of us are into the church and not into religion. And we must make a distinction between the church as an organization and religion. And much of the fire and thunder that, uh, that we get when we talk about religion is a discussion about the church as an organized entity and is a discussion of man-made theology and doctrines and not the, and I, I'll finish in a second. Not, yeah, not, hold on just a minute. I'll, I'll give you a chance to speak. And not the doctrines of, of Jesus. And not the doctrines of, 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 of uh, Hold on a minute, Josh. Are not the doctrines of Jesus Christ himself. I, as an individual, uh, do not deny the teachings of Jesus. However, I do deny the teachings of church. And there's a difference in between those two entities. And I want to make that clear. Because a truly religious person cannot be the slave of another person. A truly religious person cannot fall under the domination of another people. The truly religious person cannot be the subject of any man or anybody because he has no fear of life, he has no fear of death, he had, he, 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 his, his soul, the sole person he lives for is God and God only. He does not live for the acceptance of any other people and therefore even a king is not a threat to that individual because for him the king only has two options. To kill him and to kill him he can say go ahead on it doesn't make any difference to me at all. And what I'm saying is a lot of these people who are defending the church are churchy but not are not religious at all in their essence. And let us make a distinction between these things. Plus, we don't read this scripture. When we read this scripture and we read this Bible, we see that the major problems with the Jews in that Bible is that each time they get away from their cultural gods, each time they lose their tongue as a people, they are punished and sent into enslavement. We have not learned that lesson even though it's right in front of us. And you can see that the God was telling the Jews, and Jesus was a Jew. And he came to teach the Jews. He died a Jew.